is what we have been laddering up to all day and really all year. So you are going to be excited for it, I promise. Energy up, 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 up. I want you to give these guys the biggest welcome you can possibly muster because we are going to hear the official announcement of a decade of action for delivering the SDGs. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. My name is Trisha Shetty, and I often think of uh, the UN building, given that it's in New York, to be a bubble within a bubble. So I will ask you all to look outwards and bear with me for a brief second. I have notes, but I'm known for going rogue, so yes, me going rogue. Uh, a few months ago, I was in Assam. It's a state up northeast in India. And I was doing a field trip, going from one village to the other. And these were villages in desolate parts of the space there. Uh, every time it rains, we had to figure out different ways to get there because the roads shut down. And the whole point of this was to meet women, meet women within these communities to understand what are their challenges, to understand what are their leadership models that they're emulating, and how are they, in India we use a word called jugad, like how are they hustling their way to reclaim power and agency and get stuff done. And whilst we were at this table, most of these women were under BPL, which means below poverty line, barely making a few cents a day, you know, complaining about how within that specific place, a lot of the men are, you know, prone to alcohol addiction, that they are you know, within that specific place, bums are not picking up their weight. And whilst we were talking, they told me about a story. Their story, which happens to them on loop, is that they have one ambulance there, and every time someone is sick, they put the person in the ambulance, but the ambulance is barely functioning, and the roads are terrible. So what they do is, they put the person in the ambulance, and then 10 people surround the ambulance and physically push the ambulance with the hope that the ambulance will kickstart and they can get the person to the hospital. And they all laughed, and I laughed, and it took me a minute at the end of it to process and realize we're laughing to make sense of this madness. So the reason I'm sharing this with you is I want you to, just for a brief minute, forget about this bubble and think of your community. Think of your people, because those are my people. I made a commitment to them that I will use every platform I have access to to advocate for them, to make sure that their struggles are heard, and to make sure that when I go back home, I'm going to organize my community, organize resources, to make sure that they have right to their they have access to their fundamental rights. Because currently, they are being deprived the right to the access of their fundamental rights to health, to quality education. Their biggest worry is how will we make sure our kids, their biggest worry actually, but they made a lot of money during, um, when I say a lot of money for them in relative context, their biggest worry was that teachers are not being paid. So when they made money during harvest season, they took the money, the women, without telling their husbands and went and gave it to the teacher to let her know that we see you. So when people in the front lines who face the harshest of realities whose human rights are being stripped still have empathy and lean on empathy and tell someone else, we see you and we're showing up for you, all I'll implore upon you is to just take a brief second to think of who your people are, because those are my people. Think of who your people are and why you're here and who you're going back to to serve. Because any time today, tomorrow, over this last week, if you felt the sense of frustration with world leaders, and been told to keep quiet, simmer down, temper down a little, sanitize what you have to say. Remember who your people are. And as the DSG said yesterday, lean on courage. You're a fabulous woman who I know goes off script and speaks from your heart. And that's why I think we need more women like you to lead, to let us know that it is okay to lean on courage 
and that you do not have to be apologetic about speaking up for your people and your community because that is what has brought me here. And I will be, excuse my language, damned if I forget that and let them down. So with that note, <laughs> with that note, they deserve the clap. It's unfortunate that they don't get to be celebrated like the way I do. So on that note, I will ask you again, just take a moment, think of your community and your people. Okay, and now to work. We're almost at the close of the SDG Summit, where world leaders are focusing on challenges and opportunities ahead. And to many of the activists here, that may sound a little weird, because for a lot of us, the world leaders are very much the challenges that we have to work against. So I think there is a collective sense of understanding that this is an emergency, right? Like, show of hands. This is an emergency. Thank you. I always like to do another experiment. Uh, to the women in this audience, raise your hands if you ever had to account for who's going to touch you, who's going to stare at you, who's going to molest you every time you step out of your home, if you ever had to change your clothes based on where you're going. Just raise your hands. To the men in this room, have you ever had to think about that? Today I'm taking a train. I mean, today I'm taking a train. I need to make sure my legs are covered lest I, my, you know, someone comes and pinches my ass. If I bend, let me just make sure my hand is over my chest lest I excite someone enough for them to come and molest me. So, you know, when we talk about emergency, this is also what I'm talking about that affects our day-to-day -day lives. And I've used this example to make it known to you all that this is affecting us all. We're not just advocating for poor, marginalized people outside and we are the saviors. So, we're in a state of emergency, but we have a plan, a plan that you wonderful SDG advocates have been fighting for today, earlier today, uh, someone said, where is the plan? People talk about issues, where is the plan? And Richard got up and said, how dare you? Well, he didn't say, how dare you? I guess that was your inner voice. But he said, the plan is the SDGs. It is there, that's the blueprint, that's what we're fighting for. So, 2020 is the make or break year for us. And we have to make sure that we hold ourselves accountable to deliver, that we have to hold our world leaders accountable to deliver, and let them know that we mean business. So we know that you know, these plans are ambitious, but what does it mean in terms of getting stuff done? We're hoping and making sure that we will do everything we can to secure investment and support for grassroots activists. Any activists in the room, give yourselves a shout out. Raise your hands. Amazing. People with big wallets and charitable hearts, raise your hands up and give yourselves a clap. Or people looking to support. Come on. I see you people, people who have access to brilliant networks who would be more than happy to support. Raise your hands up. Okay, that's amazing. He didn't just raise his hand up as an activist, but also raised his hand up as a supporter. So to the others who hesitated to raise their hands up, that's the model you need to follow. Keep an eye on these people, reach out to them, track them down, okay, and hold them accountable to support you. Okay, so we need to secure investment, it means we need to maximize big political movements we have for health replenishment, anti-corruption summits, the COP, the Beijing Biodiversity Conferences to secure action. It means working together to hold our leaders to account because as much as we may say them as challenges, we need to come together to work with them to get stuff done. So how do we do that? Well, we need to figure out the game plan for that because clearly we need to lead on that front too. It means supporting each other in our efforts and coming together at key moments, much like this, to raise our voice and to make sure that the people we're advocating for, that their voices are heard. So we're coming here today, and I hope you will too, as young leaders join us for a super year of activism, as we want to push for a decade of delivery for real results and impact. Three of the biggest challenges we see that we will face moving forward is inequality, gender and climate crisis. So whatever sector you're working on, I know there are 17 goals and they're all interconnected. All we ask is think of inequality and climate justice and gender whilst you're working within your own goals. Because if you do that, you will truly make sure that we leave no one behind. Because that is the pledge that world leaders made. And on that note of leaving no one behind, I want to introduce you to three amazing activists that we have here. We have first, Kennedy Odede from Kibera. Kennedy. Woo! 
Kennedy was from the, one of the biggest slums in Africa. He grew up there and experienced extreme poverty firsthand. He launched Shining Hope and for communities, a huge grassroots organization. He is going to be a talking about tackling inequality. Thank you so much. The challenge of fighting inequality is that most of the time we forget people that and the voices that are involved. As you can see, that is a challenge. For example, people in my community, in Kibera slums, they feel they are not part of it. And that really increases what I call now inequality. Right now, the gap between the rich and the poor is too scary. We have to do something. For example, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa. Can you believe 13 African countries will not be able to fight inequality? And the numbers of the extreme poor is increasing between now and 2030. 2020 is the year. I call it emergency. And we have to do something. Otherwise, it's going to be a tipping point. I commit myself, as someone who grew up in a slum, that I'm going to organize my community, and we're going to start what is called World Poverty Forum to bring community leaders, women, girls, and men, to know that what is SDGs, and how can everyone make it possible. So I commit for my community, for people in Kibera, and I hope that we can achieve it. Thank you. Thank you, Kennedy. Um, coming up second, we have the lovely Annika George, who is 19 years old. And when she realized that young girls in London are suffering from period poverty and do not have access to quality education, she decided to take leadership and make a change and has been fighting to end period poverty, not just in London, but around the world now. So Annika, over to you to come and talk to us about achieving gender equality. Hi, everyone. Um, so I was just told I'm doing this, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, thank you for that, Trisha. Um, my name's Amica George, and in April of 2017, I read an article about girls my age or a lot younger having to miss school because they couldn't afford pads and tampons. I'm so lucky that that's something I've never suffered from myself, and I was shocked that it was happening to girls on my doorstep. Of course, period poverty isn't something that's exclusive to the UK. It's happening all around the world, and I was disgusted by it. I started a, an online petition that grew into an international movement and resulted in 2,000 young people protesting outside Downing Street, wearing red, singing about tampons, dancing, and even, even when we did all of that, the government still ignored us. A year later, I was at university but still fighting for menstrual equity, and I decided to launch a legal challenge against the British government to say that all children in the UK should have an equal access to education. And if one in 10 girls in the UK were missing school because they couldn't afford a tampon, then there was something really wrong. And in April of this year, the government finally <laughs> heard my cries and pledged to start providing the products for free in all school and college bathrooms from early next year. <laughs> Thank you. Um, of course, I was thrilled, but the fight doesn't stop there. I'm now going to take the movement um, across Europe and encourage other European leaders to follow suit. So if you're a European leader, please do that. Um, um, and I'm also fighting to tackle the stigma and taboo around menstruation. I think that period stigma is something so, um, so relevant to gender inequality. I think the fact that any boy can walk around and talk about whatever he wants, and yet all, all people who have periods, all girls and women have this dirty secret that they go through every month and feel too afraid to talk about is a huge issue and will only achieve gender equality when we can all talk about periods as easily, we, as, easily as we can talk about anything else. So 
talk about your period and thank you very much. <laughs> coming up third, coming up third, we have Safran Meena from Sri Lanka the initiator of the Young Voices for Climate Action, I apologize, Youth Voices for Climate Action, and the director of Earth Lanka. He will talk to us about tackling climate crisis. Please give him a hand. Thank you, uh, Trisha. So uh, we had the, hi everyone, this is Safran from Sri Lanka. We had the climate summit just in Monday and we are in existential threat for humanity. And in early August, I launched this campaign, Youth Voices for Climate Action, specifically focused on how young people can be involved in, in climate action in, in the region, uh, for Asia Pacific, and also to see how we can do real climate action at grassroots level, community level. Ladies and gentlemen, everything is connected to the central equilibrium of the earth and the ecosystem. Climate action, towards 1.5 degrees is a presidential threat we need to do. We need to have more intergenerational dialogue and we need to raise our ambition. We need to raise our ambition. Ladies and gentlemen, the world is running out of time and we are in its last breath. Let us all unite and avoid a decade disaster so that we and myself, I commit to act for the people and the planet in 2020 so that we can have a livable future for the future generation and the present generation and climate action, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, now that we have left you with so many notes of inspiration, I need you all to do one thing. Take out your cell phones and pin the 25th of September, that is precisely a year from now, on your calendar, and you know, the first time I asked you to think of who your people are and what you're gonna do for them, next year, you're gonna tell us what you did for them, right? Because if you're holding world leaders accountable, we shall start by holding ourselves accountable to deliver. So next year, on the 25th of September, we're celebrating the Global Day of Goals, where we're gonna to come together to talk about the decade of delivery, to push for further change, to push for further action, and accelerated progress. And in that spirit, I want to now introduce the lovely DSG, Amina Mohammed. Thank you for always asking women to claim their agency and space. Thank you for celebrating young voices who are championing for change. Thank you for asking us to lead with resilience and courage. Your voice resonates with so many of us, so thank you. That was really quiet. Hello. Hello. Okay, Trish went rogue. And then we had these three amazing young people who came on stage to talk about periods, wear red. And so this speech feels really inadequate. Um, Trish, you talked about a bubble in a bubble, but that's not what this stage feels like or this tent today. It really feels like all of you have taken us out of that bubble and helped us to reconnect with exactly what it is that we're supposed to be doing, what we live for, what we come to work at the UN for, and that's about changing people's lives, making a much more peaceful and equitable world. And we've got 17 amazing goals for that, so it is the response to the challenges that we have today. Um, and, and it's tough, it's not an easy, we sit here and we, we, we resolutions, cross T's, dot, dot I's, um, I've just been sitting on a podium listening to leader after leader, um, who's you know, telling the world their woes, because this place in the end is that town hall where we all get a voice, and, and today yours is in the tent, theirs is in the General Assembly, but it's all within the United Nations, so I'm so glad that we've been able to bring everyone in. The Secretary General talked about his decade for the action at, uh, on delivering on the goals, and I think that that's important because, again, Richard, you've been talking about what do we do differently, because we're almost five years down the road and we need these points to just tell us what's the temperature, are we getting there, are we not? And Trisha said to us, you know, what about our representation? How representative are we of our people when we come up here, um, away from the villages, um, away from the countries and the societies that, that, we, that we advocate for? 
So that decade is going to be really important to everyone. And we've got a couple of months, or maybe a couple of weeks, to really think about what that means. How do we walk back from what we envision in 2030 and make it happen so we don't walk beyond 2030 without making it happen? Really thinking about the decade day by day, because if we think about it month or years ahead, then we miss the people who don't know whether they'll survive today. So we have to bring the urgency back into the lives of people who don't know tomorrow and can barely think um, about yesterday because they suffered so much. So it's, it's a real good opportunity to get together, to band together. Now, as we go back to our countries, we've got different constituencies. This is not easy, it is a journey. And that 10-year journey requires for us to lift this individually and collectively. And collectively sometimes means strange bedfellows, people you wouldn't ordinarily sit with in a room. But we do, we need sometimes to dine with the devil with a long spoon. They're doing stuff that we would never do or ever imagine. Yet somehow we have to reach out and we have to touch hearts and minds and make the changes that are needed in order to get the SDGs delivered. So this decade of action for us is one that's coming not too soon. And, and, and for us, it's not about New York, it's about coming down from 40,000 feet to the countries and making a difference in everyone's life. Some of those people are going to take some nudging Others, we're going to have to scream a little. Um, some, we will pull. Um, others will come willingly, if only they know. If only they know that the little that they do makes so much difference in any, anyone and everyone's lives. Many of the discussions may not be in a room like this. May just be one at your dining table, or one that happens with businessmen in the back room or their clubs down the road. But wherever it is, we have to raise those voices to find solutions to make the change, because we can. And it is absolutely doable if we can all come together to do it. So from us at the UN, you will see us on the ground. Um, there is Akim Steiner has to stand up because he's in charge of the UNDP. That is our development vehicle that goes across more than 170 countries around the world. And that's what the DP is in the UNDP, the development program. Akim, please stand up because you're also on the front Woo! line. And it's really important. Of course, behind us, there are thousands of uh, UN workers and staff who put their life on the front line um, to support countries, to support you. But there is no one more, I think, engaged in this than perhaps the Secretary General himself. Um, he has to speak across everything, from the political to the development, and he's got this huge team that he has to put together. I just wanted to let you know that he believes that each and every one of you is a part of that team. That's why this is a global call for everyone. It's not just about not delivering the goals and making sure we don't leave anyone behind, but we can't leave anyone behind because all hands, feet, legs, whatever you've got on deck so that we get this decade delivered. Thank you very much. I will now be handing over the mic to the next two super fabulous hosts, Dr. Alam Muradit and Richard Curtis, who I could never do justice by introducing, so I'm going to give it over to them. And I will have the great honor to be with uh, DSG whilst we go over to the UN building and tell world leaders a collective message from you young people and let them know that we mean business and that we're ready to work with them. So over to you, Ala and Richard. Thanks so much, Trisha, and all our speakers, including the DSG. It is always a tough act to follow. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about what's happening this week in New York, and a lot does happen here this week, but it's actually a lot more important for us to look at what's happening outside. So this video that we're going to be putting up right now has over half a million people in a hundred countries reflecting on the sustainable development goals. It's one of many initiatives by groups like the SDG Action Campaign, so please take a look.
it is so exciting to watch that. And I'm a, a, a well, three times Amica's age. Uh, and so I've been campaigning a long time. And I suppose my strong message is that we are all about to be unbelievably impressed and already are by the number of people spending the amount of passion that they do fighting for the causes in which they believe. But my particular message at the moment is there's also a thing about timing, which is hugely popular, you, important. You have to create famous deadlines. And we want 2020, and particularly the UN's next meeting here in 2020, to be a moment where we don't say again the Sustainable Development Goals, they're a great idea, let's do some stuff on it. What we have to try and do is all of us to continue fighting as hard as we always do, but give 10% this year extra to timing things on January the 1st, timing things in September, getting together, meeting together, supporting other people doing other things. There's gonna be all sorts of stuff, I'll tell you some more of that later, but I think the real focus is to believe in and be impressed by all your amazing partners in this area, and then for us to work out how we work together and how, as it were, we pack the biggest punch to make sure that everyone who's delaying, everyone who's just talking about what they might do, everyone who's making plans that are too slow suddenly realizes 2020, I have to accelerate and do more. So that's how I see this. And someone who packs an incredible punch and has been a campaigner his whole life um, will be the first person I ask to come up to stage to talk to us. Human rights underpin the entirety of the SDGs and are really the basis of the Sustainable Development Goals. So I am very happy to ask one of the most incredible campaigners, Secretary General of Amnesty International, to please stand up, Kumi Naido. The floor is yours. Thank you. No, you can talk now. <laughs> so thank you very much. If we are to achieve the SDGs moving forward, we need a different approach than what we had after the global financial crisis, which was all about system recovery, system maintenance, and system protection. The system of governance and economy is broken, so what we need to achieve all of the goals is actually system redesign, system innovation, and system transformation. Let's not kid ourselves that we can rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic while humanity is sinking. The second point is, as far as civil society is concerned, it's important while we are here and we create an illusion that governments and civil society are always on the same side, I need to put a, fig a reality on the table. Every week, three environmental activists on average were killed and murdered last year. So as Amnesty International and the human rights community, we are saying to activists everywhere around the world, continue the resistance, continue the fight, and Amnesty and other human rights organizations will stand behind all the different organizations to defend you to the best our capability, and we ask our governments to do likewise. <laughs> thirdly, sorry, please don't clap, I only got one minute. <laughs> so thirdly, if history teaches us anything, when humanity faced a major challenge, whether it was slavery, women's right to vote, uh, civil rights in the United States, uh, apartheid in South Africa. Those struggles only move forward when decent men and women stood up and said, enough is enough and no more. We prepare to put our lives on the line. We prepare to go to prison if necessary. If we are to make the changes that we need, we have to understand that many of our political and business leaders sadly suffer from the same medical condition, which is they all seem to have a problem hearing. <laughs> and when they have a problem hearing, we need peaceful civil disobedience to push them to act as fast as is necessary. And we ask our governments to recognize that we are going to intensify civil disobedience if governments do not act as fast as the situation calls for. Finally, with regard to uh, the climate catastrophe that we're in, we just have these words to say as the human rights community that met and issued a declaration on Wednesday, Thursday, saying that Climate change constitutes a mass death penalty on all the people on our planet. Climate change is the biggest human rights challenge that we face, and we simply say this in conclusion. We need to recognize that nature does not negotiate. We cannot change the science. All we can do is change political will, and thankfully, 
political will is a renewable resource, if you know what I mean. Thank you very much. Well, Kumi and I have worked together on some campaigns which became famous, and he names famous campaigns like the apartheid campaign and the suffragette campaign, and now Black Lives Matter and Greta's climate campaign. So fame, stories, you can't fight for your rights if you don't know what they are. Uh, and I would just like to ask Nikolai, who, with whom I once did a video in which he sang very poorly. <laughs> um, uh, so let's hope he doesn't sing what he's going to say. But Nikolai, you talk to us a little bit about storytelling in this context and communicating so millions of people hear the passion which, which yes. we feel. Yes, thank you. And yes, it was terrible singing, <laughs> and I will not sing. Although now I really do want to sing, but I won't. Um, I'm a goodwill ambassador for the UNDP, um, and I've been very fortunate to travel around the world and see the work that uh, the many people that do to better the lives of all of us. Um, I, I was just in Peru. Uh, we went down there because of um, the story about the Amazon fires. Um, I wanted to try to understand and get behind uh, the images that we all were shocked by. Of course, you find out very quickly that it's complex. Um, and I think that one of the things I'd say as a storyteller uh, is that it's important to remember the complexity. Sometimes it's easy to get carried away because we want the many likes, we want the, uh, the, uh, the media to go crazy. Uh, with the Amazon, I think it backfired because suddenly you had two presidents fighting it out, bitching about each other, which was not helpful. But what I want to say, storytelling, uh, just a little story about a man I met in Peru, uh, an old uh, an artist called Victor Delphine. It was in Lima. Uh, I came to his house, and it was a beautiful house. There was art everywhere, like sculptures. The I mean, it was incredible. And the house has kind of grown bigger and bigger. And I, m I met him. He was on the third floor in his studio. He was not. They told me before I went in that maybe he's naked. He likes to be naked. He wasn't naked, but he was very nice, and he was very inspiring. And he was working. He was still working. And then he said, "Sometimes I will go upstairs." and I will be amazed by what I've achieved in my life. And my point of this is, there's nothing we humans can do. Yes, we can destroy the planet. We are very good at that, but we can also rebuild. I went to the uh, Amazon, I saw, you know, after deforestation, I also saw places where the, the Amazon had re re regrown. Um, I'm very proud to work with the UNDP. I'm very proud to be here today to see all of you. I'm inspired by all of you. I'm inspired by you guys. Uh, we have to work hard for the DSGs, and we will, we will accomplish this because we, there is no alternative. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have to be honest, as you were telling that story, I did not expect it to go to an overly confident naked man. Um, that, was, that was a twist. Um, <laughs> One of many stories, I'm sure. Um, e how many of you guys have seen some of the Sustainable Development Goal and Global Goal signage in Times Square and on some of the bus stops? <laughs> it's been around the city, so it almost goes as no surprise that New York has embraced the Sustainable Development Goals. While many cities have not, we're incredibly honored to have Penny Aberwardina, who is the Commissioner for International Affairs for New York City, to tell us about some incredible initiatives they have, some big news they announced, and how can we get other cities to do a little bit of what New York is doing without taking you, the UN there? Well, that's a fair point. Um, first of all, New York City is very proud to be host to the UN, and to talk about, I'm here to talk about how local governments actually can work for our people. Um, for example, when the Trump administration pulled out of the uh, Paris Agreement, we saw that coming within 18 hours. New, uh, New York City's mayor signed an executive order committing us directly to the Paris Agreement. We worked with the US Conference of Mayors and 420 US cities are committed directly to the Paris Agreement. Now, <laughs> thank you. So in 2015, we had our One NYC development agenda. Um, Mayor de Blasio had a very strong equity lens when looking at sustainability and resiliency. And what we did was map our development agenda to the, uh, the sustainable development goals. 
and we had synergies with all of them. So we created a platform called Global Vision Urban Action to really showcase how New York City is localizing the SDGs. From a population perspective, we are as large, if not larger, than 141 countries, but we are also not Manhattan. We have five boroughs with structural inequities that we have to really take on. So the SDGs became a framework a common framework and language for us to exchange best practices beyond our borders. So now I'm gonna fast forward to the realities back in 2018, uh, the very unfortunate American realities. We knew that um, our government was not gonna submit a voluntary national review. So we worked with um, the Secretary General's office, the DSG and other UN officials, and we created the concept of a voluntary local review. We wanted to ensure that local governments and our, our leadership on localizing the SDGs were taken notice. And so we, um, we uh, presented the first voluntary local review to the UN last summer during the high level political uh, forum. Since then, it has become a movement. It is not just a report and it has become a tool for activists and, and city um, community members to essentially encourage their local governments to showcase what they are doing in terms of um, climate action, gender equity, and report that directly to the UN. Um, I think this, this, move, uh, this movement is particularly important, not only as an American, but throughout the world, we are seeing national governments abdicate their responsibility on the issues that matter to us, and we have to show up. So I just wanna say that local governments are flexing their leadership, and we are taking a seat at the table, and it's up to all of you to hold us accountable to ensure that we're doing that throughout the world, so thank you. What I get so excited about is when you actually see all the troops lining up. Suddenly there you have the mayors and you have the cities and we've seen the school children. Um, and uh, I feel as though one of the most important things without which we could not have thrived in the campaigns that I've worked for is the faith community. They were absolutely always the foot shoulders when we were fighting for debt cancellation and they so often turn up with such passion and such consistency. The Make Poverty History campaign and the Women's Suffragette movement, they've always been there. So I think we have a representative here, the most beautiful name, Rudel Mar de Faria. Um, and I would love to hear from you, sir, what the ACT Alliance is planning and if you're focusing as well on 2020. Yeah, thank you. Yes, indeed, churches play an important and faith communities role in terms of poverty eradication. But they also play a very negative role sometimes in terms of promoting gender equality and uh, perpetuating patriarchal, social, and cultural norms that are undermining one of the major SDGs. Um, the ACT Alliance is a coalition of uh, churches and church-related organizations working in more than uh, 240, uh, 140 countries, and uh, all of them, all of our members, they are engaging all the SDGs, but there is one that we are dealing as alliance, that is the gender equality, the SDG 5, because we do not believe that any of the other SDGs will be able to be achieved if gender will not be mainstream in all of them. So, and... For that reason, our commitment as ACT Alliance is exactly to be the leading faith-based organization dealing with gender justice, uh, including issues related to sexual reproductive health and rights and the rights of the LGBTQI community. So that is our commitment and what we will be uh, doing in the next decades. But we hope that it will not take more than two decades for us to eradicate gender inequality. Thank you. Make it one. Go on. Can I just say how incredible it is to hear you say that? Um, I started my organization in 2011, and we really looked at faith as a way in which we could talk about um, the perpetuation of gender inequality and how faith is often used to misrepresent and negate gender equality. And I, I'm sure, how many people here have been to more than one or two or five or ten meetings this week? And in the vast majority of them, I have walked out borderline depressed 
because everybody said we're not going to achieve it, it's not doable, the world is becoming more authoritarian and more nationalist, and 10 years ago that would have been an almost impossible conversation to hear anywhere in the UN, but especially as it relates to gender equality, so thank you for a very personal off the, but thank you, because I think that's awesome. And finally, the private sector. So in my great tradition of introducing badass women, um, I would like to introduce Paulina from the World Benchmarking Alliance, who can tell us a little bit about how her company is contributing to the SDGs. Hi. I think that is the first time I've ever been introduced as badass, so I'm not sure uh, I'm going to do that justice, but let's, let's give it a go. First of all, I'm not a company. I represent uh, the World Benchmarking Alliance. We're a multi-stakeholder initiative launched uh, this time last year, so we, we celebrated our birthday yesterday. We bring together civil society, business, finance, governments, and others to incentivize business to take action on the SDGs. We will do this by measuring and ranking the 2,000 most, most influential companies in the world. We call these 2,000 companies Keystone Companies. They are the ones that can, with the right leadership and with the right support, shift entire systems to meet the goals. The Keystone Companies have the power to behave like Keystone species. We borrow the term Keystone from, from biology. They can achieve transformational, transformational not incremental, incremental change, sorry. So this is what happened in Yellowstone Park. Um, you might know the wolves were reintroduced to the park and uh, subsequently the park ecosystem and nature thrived. So the WBA will name these Keystone companies in January 2020 and by 2023 we will be ranking all of the 2000 companies. They'll sit across seven systems depending on their core business. So for example, Coca-Cola will sit in our food system uh, Google and Microsoft will be in our digital system and all 2,000 companies will be measured on their social um, uh, contribution. Social system and, and people are at the heart of every business, so this is critical to what we need to measure. Um, we're also thrilled to be partnering the Business Avengers campaign led by Project Everyone and so we'll be t working together with these uh, companies to do so. Thank you so much. Just to make that completely clear, that is a, both will be a carrot and a stick. And that seems incredibly important with regard to us and business and companies that we really do praise those that are doing proper things and point out to people that perhaps they shouldn't be investing into people who aren't investing in the SDGs. Yeah, and so what we've heard tonight is some brilliant things being done across the board from young people who are telling us to talk about our periods more to alliances that are really taking companies to task uh, to challenging faith leaders on their role in social norms. So we've heard about all of these incredible amazing things that are actually changing and making the SDGs possible. We can make them even more powerful by talking with each other, working together, sharing information, amplifying what's working, drowning out a lot of the negative noise by talking about all the positive things that are happening around the world. So, Richard, I believe you're going to tell us about a few more initiatives. Yeah, it's just that not everyone can be in the room, and I just do want to say, I mean, I'm very keen we should get together in January. I'm very keen we should make a very sincere plan for September, but there are also, we have got, we're doing the world's largest lesson, the, the, who are in the people I work with, which will be getting this message out to children in 150 countries all the way through the year. Global Citizen are announcing tomorrow an extraordinary series of concerts meant to be sort of taking the space of some of the big concerts that have happened before and demanding, I think they're trying to build up a huge amount of money as a specific result of those concerts. We have the Generation Equality UNICEF campaign. So I think that I would just say there is no limit to the number of people who are pushing. The challenge for all of us today is not only to succeed in what we're doing, but actually succeed in a coherent manner that puts pressure on the UN and on countries. And I think our particular challenge in the next few months is to work out the forum here at the UN in September that can actually act as an effective mechanism to deliver on the decade of action year after year. 
Exactly. That perfectly summed it up. Our big challenge is what does it actually deliver out of this room and out of this week, right? So we heard from Trisha at the beginning about who we bring into the room whenever we walk into it and who we go back to in the communities we're accountable to. So what are we actually doing to make progress on gender equality, reducing inequalities, climate change, and how can we make sure working together, working coordinated, we can do that even better? Yeah. And there are some people in this room who are really working on it. Um, there's Action for Sustainable Development, who you've just seen. They're really important key partners. I hope Project Anyone, will, everyone will be useful. The UN Foundation are really working hard. Restless Development are really working hard on this so that we've got a real core here, and if all of us can try and gather together, I think that we will be able to come up with specific demands and specific timings to try and achieve genuine to set a format, not only for a big year in 2020, but a format then, as it were, that crunches through every year for the next decade. Because these goals are the one extraordinary plan that we've got. They have been signed by every country. So as it were, we're no longer saying this is something we would like you to do that we feel strongly about. These are things that the countries have themselves promised on. So I'm looking forward to working with all of you. I hope we're all looking forward to working with each other and we'll be back here on the next birthday of the Sustainable Development Goals, tired, angry, a bit proud yeah. <laughs> of having done. Hopefully of having very done a proud. Good years, of having done a good year's work. Um, I would like to finish uh, with a flair, as it were. Uh, Emmy Mahmood is a friend of, great friend of my daughter's, a great campaigner, a great person, and I think she's here. I'm going to give us a bit of zeal and creativity to show what's at the very center of everything we do. Emmy, over to you. I unpack the contents of my suitcase. The moon is rising on an earth divided. And I'm here with my brothers and sisters trying to be the bridge. My two decades were dotted with important global moments. The right to gay marriage, the Human Genome Project, the referendum that freed South Sudan. So I took the flight thinking maybe we could change something. Life is more bitter when it's decided in your absence. So this is me showing up. From the air, Kakuma looked like any other refugee camp I'd seen before. From the ground, it brought to light the truth of an earth divided. Seven billion people at the breaking point. Hearing about crisis and seeing it are as different as speaking about change and making it. One is fleeting and relies on the attention span of a restless planet. The other is everlasting and delves to the core of what makes us human. I was seven when the first astronauts populated the International Space Station. 11, when the tsunami hit Indonesia. 18, when the first Arab woman won the Nobel Prize. 19, when I voted for the first African-American president's first, second term. 23, when women around the world marched in solidarity. 24, when I set foot in Kakuma. In December of 2010, a Tunisian street vendor set himself on fire and sparked the revolution that would define the decade. His life the world continues to spring forward every day, his life a flash on the proverbial timeline as if the most important of moments are only accomplished before we are born or after we die. The refugee protocol, the eradication of smallpox, the day when we can all finally reverse the effects of climate change. I begin to wonder if the air was as restless when my mother marched for education, if the people were as divided when my godfather and his friends organized for freedom. How do you bridge a fissure that seems to transcend time in the absence of progress to put the truth, the future ahead at the expense of our own well-being. But the constant question, are we asking enough? Are we doing enough? And are we enough?
Can we bring forth a change in paradigm so pronounced it begs the walls to break, it asks the earth to shake, and when it shakes, we grab onto the closest thing we can find. In my mind, we find each other from Sana'a to Lesbos, from Berlin to DC. I saw people in London in solidarity with kids in Ramallah, mothers from Syria sending love to families at the border. On a Friday morning, I hear the news of New Zealand as I prepare for my own prayers. My scarf draped over my sister and I. The words, hello brother, welcome. The last things plastered into our mind as one of the last things the uncle said before the shooter opened fire. There are no words for the perversion of a safe space, an offering of peace in a moment of solidarity. Nothing is more wonderful than the art of being free, but nothing is more difficult to learn how to use than freedom. Those words are as true today as they were in the 1800s. From, sun <laughs> from vigils to protests, from planning sessions to movements, we're joined in our humanity. From dinners to prayer circles, we're bringing the good. We're growing up to become the leaders we wish for as kids, choosing triumph, choosing hope over the problems that threaten to erase us, making change not in spite of, but because of who we are. My grandmother never learned to read or write. Women weren't allowed to do that in Sudan back then. Yet I'm here, the daughter of immigrants, the granddaughter of an illiterate woman, a Muslim, a millennial, standing before you, unfazed by the people that still greet us with hatred, untouched by the words that denied our humanity. When the plane coasted over Kakuma, the fields of white below, too organized for stones, too low to be clouds. I wanted to close my eyes, but reality wouldn't allow me the luxury. Now I'm proud to say that yes, we're still stuck at 2 a.m., but 2 a.m. the day before our evolution. 2 a.m. the day before everything changes as long as we change it together. The world is more bitter when it's decided in your absence, so this is us showing up. This is us choosing love. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. I was Thank you. I haven't been that nervous in a long time. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, two years ago, I stood in Darfur and saw this giant sign, which is where I'm from, a giant sign that said, Al-Amn Mas'uliyat al jamir which means security is the responsibility of all. And it had the faces of John Jawid crossed out, it had weapons crossed out, and it was a campaign by the military um, to, I guess, promote their version of peace. And I thought to myself, no, Peace is the responsibility of all. And I made a choice in that moment to try and spread the idea that we can create a collective responsibility for peace in a place that felt like it hadn't moved for decades, a place that I <laughs> had my whole life defined by. I thought, you know what? Maybe it's time for us to move something. So I walked a thousand kilometers across Sudan in 30 days and thousands of people joined me across the way. It was, <laughs> it was six months it was six months between when I saw the billboard and when we finished the walk. It was nine months between when we took the last step of the walk and the revolution began. And it was one year between when we took the first step of the walk and the dictator fell. In <laughs> one year, youth and people just like completely changed the history overnight. And the reality is that when people in power are not willing to engage with risk, it's often young people that are left to engage with that risk. I decided to put myself in between young people and the thing in danger because often all they have to engage with that risk is their own bodies and they lose their bodies and I found that out personally this year when even after all of that happened, um, my baby cousin, Mohammed, who I'm dedicating this talk to, was killed uh, in January in the protests in Sudan. He was 15 years old. And it hit me very personally as someone who's in this space and who has a voice and has a platform and is fighting for it and always trying to remind people of the urgency. But taking that personal toll was a very personal reminder 
it hurt and it reminded me that we, we just have to keep moving because in the space between when policy is thought of and when it's affected, there's a buffer zone where we lose people. And I've been losing people since I was very young, since the genocide in Darfur started, since these protests started. In that space, in that buffer space is where we operate where every single one of you will operate. The reality is that these 10 years that we're talking about, the people on the ground cannot afford 10 years. 10 years even is too much. We need to do this now. So I've committed to engaging with risk and mitigating it as much as I can with my voice and with everything that I am. That's what I stand for. I'm asking you, what do you stand for? And will you stand with me? Thank you, Thank you so much. Let's have a huge round of applause for the announcement of the, <laughs> of the Decade of Action for Delivering the SDGs. I've been so hyped for this announcement that when I ran off the stage and no one ran on, it never even occurred to me that we'd had a miscue. I just thought, of course, they have a light show or a fog machine or some amazing dramatic thing, and they had something even better. They had rock stars. So seriously, for every single person in this entire Decade of Action announcement, we just need to give them a huge ovation. Um, the SDGs had it right. Or the SDG, all new acronyms at the UN. The DSG had it right. This tent did not feel like a bubble, did it? Not at all. We have never before had a space like this at the UN, like the SDG Action Zone, where we are bringing together every voice, every idea, innovation, every innovation, and we get to hear from all of you. And tonight was exactly what we wanted in this space and what we hope to have in this space for a long time to come, because we are hoping that the decade of action that's ahead is one like the world has never seen. Are you ready to do that? in 2020 and beyond. So let's do it right now. The Decade of Action starts right now. Let's have a huge round of applause. We love you. Live stream audience, we love you. Speakers, we are so glad for the work that you're doing. And with that, we'll see you at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning.